Welcome to the St. Helena Historical Society's Susan Silvestrin Memorial Lecture Series. My name's Kathy Carrick. I'm one of the board members of the Historical Society, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce the presenters of today's lecture. We're going to be covering the topic of uh, the settlement of Napa Valley through land grants. And our first speaker will be Miriam Hansen. She's going to talk about specifically the various land grants that were given to both Mexican and Europeans that came to this valley. And our second lecturer will be Dave Henry, who's a miller at Bale Grist Mill, and Dave will specifically be talking about the Bale family and the influence of Bale Grist Mill on the development of uh, and population of early Napa Valley. So we're going to start with Miriam first. All right, I'm Miriam Hansen. I'm the uh, the research director at the St. Helena Historical Society, and I'm pleased to present Mexican land grants of Napa County. So a brief, brief timeline of California history. From 1765 to 1821, Mexico and Alta California were part of the Spanish Empire. Mexico declared independence in 1821 and three years later, Alta California became a territory of Mexico. Soldiers, ranchers, and others coveted the rich coastal lands that the missions controlled. And Mexico feared that the mission padres would be loyal to Spain. And so, in 1833, the Catholic Church was ejected from Mexican territory. Lands were to be given to neophyte in natives but this never happened. The native people became virtual slaves on the land grants. Why were land grants given by the Mexican government? They wanted to create a civil society after the departure of the church and after the secularization of the mission lands. They wanted to establish a buffer zone north of San Francisco Bay against possible other interlopers and they were worried about what the Russians would do at Fort Ross. And there was concern about the Hudson's Bay Company, trappers and mountain men who were making inroads in this area. And requirements to receive a land grant were a conversion to Catholicism and becoming a citizen of Mexico. General Vallejo was an officer of the Republic of Mexico and shaped the transition of Alta California from a territory of Mexico to the U.S. state of California. Vallejo, as commander of the Northern California District, had the power to arrange land grants for his family and his friends. Here's a map of Napa County with the, the land grants shown in different colors. By this time, the U.S. land grant courts had confirmed 75% of the grants, a process that took many years and much expense for surveyors and lawyers. Many Mexican grantees could not pay and lost their land. The first land grant in Napa County was in 1836. Rancho Camas was granted to George Yaunt by Governor Nicolas Gutierrez. 11,814 acres, it extended from Whitehall Lane to Yountville Crossroad. Camus was the name of a subgroup of the Mishawal Wapo. The rancho included present-day Yountville, Oakville, and Rutherford. Through the influence of General Vallejo, George C. Yount received the two leagues rancho and became the first permanent Euro-American settler in the Napa Valley. At left is the diseño, or map, of Rancho Camus drawn at the time that Yaunt received the grant. At right is the survey map. 
wise grantees had their land surveyed to establish firm boundaries. As you can see by the map on the left, is quite vague. After George Yant's death in 1865, his remaining lands were sold at auction. And here is the 1876 Rancho Camus map, which shows the names of the property owners of the time, which is a crucial research tool for me. At the very southern end of the grant is the town of Yonville, and then further north, Oakville, and even further north, Rutherford. Rancho Entre Napa, granted to Nicholas Higuera in 1836. At left is the Mexican Diseño, and at right, the 1876 map of Rancho Entre Napa. Nicholas Higuera was a soldier in San Francisco from 1819 to 1823, and alcalde, or mayor, at Sonoma. Higuera subdivided and sold much of the land in 1847, retaining 876 acres for himself. Nathan Coombs purchased 80 acres in 1847, he founded and laid out the town of Napa in 1848. Nicholas Higuera also got Rancho Rincón de los Carneros granted to Nicholas in 1836, and it comprised 2,588 acres. Next, we have Rancho Napa, granted to Salvador Vallejo in 1838. At left is the Diseño of Rancho Napa, and at right is the 1876 map. The Rancho Napa is shown in the tan colors. Jose Manuel Salvador Vallejo, who lived from 1813 to 1876, was the younger brother of General Vallejo. He was a captain of the militia at Sonoma, and he married Maria de la Cruz Carrillo. Salvador Vallejo subdivided and sold much of the land in 1847 and retained 3,179 acres for himself. And here we have a photo of Salvador. In 1863, Salvador Vallejo was a major in the Union Army in the Civil War. And after the Civil War, he resigned and returned to his ranch in Napa in 1865, and he died in 1876. Rancho Yohomi was granted to Damaso Rodriguez in 1841. The one and a half leagues were granted to Damaso, who lived from 1782 to 1847. Father Sarah himself baptized Damaso uh, in December 15, 1782, at Monterey. Damaso became a soldier and wound up in Sonoma under Vallejo and received his grant in 1841. During the Bear Flag Revolt, Damaso was beaten up by the American Bear Flaggers and died. Salvador Vallejo applied for and received his land grant in 1864. Rancho Loca Lomi, granted to William Pope. William Pope was born in Kentucky and he married Juliana Salazar. He joined with Cyrus Alexander, William Knight, and William Gordon on a trip to the Napa Valley in 1841. They stayed at George C. Yant's home. Before the four split up, each claimed a valley for his own. Pope petitioned General Vallejo for two square league parcel on the east side of Howell Mountain where he built a home for his family. He died after he injured himself while chopping wood in 1843, only two years later. Juliana then married Elias Barnett, who was a settler who had squatted on her land, we now know as Pope Valley. Rancho Wichica was granted to Jacob Lease in 1841. At left is the Diseño, and at right, the 1876 map of Rancho Huichica of 18,704 acres, which contains most of the Carneros region in South Napa County. Jacob Lease married General Vallejo's sister and moved to Sonoma in 1841. And here he is, 
Lise was a San Francisco pioneer who built the first permanent house in San Francisco and was the second permanent resident. He built a store in 1837 and he married Maria Rosalia Vallejo. Lise continued the business until 1841 when he sold out to the Hudson's Bay Company. Lise moved his business and residence to Sonoma. Rancho Tuluque, granted 1841 to Cayetano Juarez. The Tuluque name originates with the Tulques and Ulucas, who were natives of the Patwin tribe who lived there. The grant was on the east side of the Napa River. Cayetano Juarez, who lived 1809 to 1883, was a soldier at the Presidio of San Francisco until 1836. Juarez married Maria de Jesus Higuera. Under Vallejo, Juarez was assigned to manage the land and associated native population of the Napa Sonoma County region. For his decade of service to the government, Juarez was granted the two square league Rancho Tuluque. In 1840, before the grant deed was finalized, Cayetano Juarez moved his family from Sonoma to Napa Valley. During the year 1840, he built his first adobe house, which is still standing in Napa. Rancho Chimiles granted to Ignacio Berriesa in 1842. Jose Ignacio Mariano Berriesa received 17,762 acres and named his grant Rancho Chimiles. Rancho Chimiles was sold to Nathan Coombs and William Gordon in 1851. After receiving the grant in 1842, Berryessa sold it to William Gordon and Nathan Coombs. It was known as the Gordon Ranch and later as Gordon Valley. To get there, take Highway 121 to Wooden Valley, then Gordon Valley Road, which will lead you to Fairfield. Rancho Malacomes, granted to Jose Santos Berryessa, 1841. Rancho Malacomas was also called Moristul and Malacomas y Plano de Agua Caliente. It was 17,742 acres north of Calistoga in Malacomas Valley, which was at one time the name for Mount St. Helena. Thomas P. Knight, a participant in the Bear Flag Revolt, bought two square leagues of the northern portion of the valley, which is now known as Knight's Valley. Jose Santos Berriesa was a soldier at the Presidio of Sonoma from 1840 to 1842 and alcalde in 1846. He was jailed with two of his brothers by John C. Fremont in 1846 during the Bear Flag Revolt. Jose died in 1864. Rancho La Jota granted to George Yaunt in 1843. Rancho La Jota was 4,454 acres. It is said that Jota is Spanish for J, the first letter in Jorge, as he took the name Jorge Concepcion Yant. Yant planted, planned to construct a sawmill on his land. Edwin Angwin, in 1875, purchased 200 acres and established the Angwin Resort there. By the 1900s, Edwin owned almost 1,600 acres and Angwin is named after him. In 1909, Angwin sold the property to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who established the Pacific Union College on the site. Rancho Las Putas, granted to Jose and Sixto Berriesa in 1843. Rancho Las Putas was 35,516 acres, given to Jose de Jesus Berriesa and Sixto Berriesa. The name comes from Puta Creek, which ran through the grant. The brothers, Sisto Antonio and Jose de Jesus, served in the Mexican army in San Francisco. In 1838, the two men married twin sisters. Jose de Jesus married Maria Anastasia Higuera, and Sisto Antonio married Maria Nicolasa Higuera. The brothers built adobe estate houses about a third of the way up the valley and they, had, they were known for their racehorses and they loved to gamble. 
Rancho Catacula, granted to Joseph Childs in 1844. Colonel Joseph Ballinger Childs, who lived from 1810 to 1885, first came to California in 1841 with the Bartleson Bidwell Party. In 1844, Childs was granted two square league Rancho Catacula, and Childs set up a grist mill and later built a distillery and began producing whiskey on a small scale. He made several trips across the country. In 1843, he led the Walker Childs Party that included the two daughters of George C. Yon. Joseph married for the second time to Margaret Garnhart in 1853, who was 17 years younger. The Childs House, built in 1848, is one of the oldest in Napa County and sits uh, um, on the property of Inglenook Winery. How it got there from Childs Valley is another story. Their son, Henry Lee Childs, took over the ranch when Joseph died in 1885. And finally, our own land grant, Rancho Carne Humana, granted to Edward Turner Bale in 1841. Here is the 1841 diseño and the 1876 map of Rancho Carne Humana. The name means human flesh in Spanish. There is speculation as to why the name was chosen. The grant was originally known to the native residents as Huilic Noma and also Colijolmanoc. Dr. Bale an English, was an English physician. He married Maria Ignacia Soberanes and moved to the rancho in 1843. Bale established the, the mill in 1846. Maria, Sober, Maria Ignacia Soberanes de Bale was left with managing his estate after Bale died and battled the courts for decades to hang on what was left of the original land grant. Bale had often used land in payment for services rendering him, rendered to him, and his family was financially pressed after his death. Maria sold 126 acres to the founders of St. Lena, Henry Still and Charles Walters, and the deed was recorded in 1854. And now I will return, turn the speech over to the real expert on this matter of the bale mill. I'm Dave Henry. <clears throat> I am one of the millers at the bale grist mill. Um, our story, if we can get the first slide, this is what the grist mill looks like today. And if you drive by, you'll see a banner out in front that says 150 years. This version of the mill opened in 1850. This part here, only up to here, was the 1846 mill. It was expanded. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But the story about Dr. Bale begins in 1810. He was born in the north of England and was educated and he moved to London for his advanced medical education where he attended about three or four different medical schools. About in 1835 or so, he was about ready to open a surgery practice in London when he found that the British Crown was preparing charges to throw him into debtor's prison because he wasn't a very good businessman. So he did what a lot of people did in those days. He fled his country. He went to Dover, signed on to the HMS Harriet as a crew member, and left, never to see England again. The next time he's recorded on dry land, it's in 1836, and he is in Monterey, in Alta, California. Dr. Bale told the story that as the Harriet was coming up the coast of Mexican Alta, California, it hit some rocks and broke apart, and he was the only one to make it to shore alive. 
Well, today we know that's not true because Monterey was the capital of Alta California and there was a customs house there. And international ports of call keep accurate records of comings and goings. And there's records of the Harriet landing and there's records of the Harriet leaving, but Dr. Bale was not on it. So he was either voted off the ship or jump ship. We don't know which, he never told anybody. But he was an interesting character. To give you an example, Shortly after he was stranded in Monterey, he's renting a room in somebody's house. And to make a little bit of spending money, he was making and selling patent medicines. So patent medicines in the 1830s were basically just alcohol with other stuff in it, like opium or laudanum or mercury or God knows what else. The landlord was concerned that Dr. Bale was going to burn his house down by operating a still in his room. So he reported him to the authorities and Dr. Bale got thrown into jail for a little while. Shortly after this episode, the commander of the Mexican army, who at the time was Lieutenant Colonel Mariano Guadalupe Bale, or Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo, was summoned by the governor and told of the activities of the Russians on the northern coast of Sonoma. And concerns the Mexican government had with the Russians establishing a foothold in their territory. So Vallejo was told to take his um, Mexican army detachment and take it to the northernmost settlement in Sonoma. At that time, it was Sonoma, the city of Sonoma. And he was, when he got there, he was to secularize the mission that was there and give it back to the Indians. And two, he was to build a presidio to permanently house a large garrison of Mexican army so that the Russians could be pushed out fairly quickly. General Vallejo knew or had heard about this, Mex or this uh, uh, English doctor that was stranded in Monterey and hired him to come with him and provide medical services to his army unit. So Dr. Bale became the Surgeon General of this detachment of the Mexican army and came and lived in Monterey, or in, lived in Sonoma with uh, General Vallejo. After living and working there, he uh, became a Mexican citizen so he could legally own land. He learned Spanish, he converted to Catholicism, and he uh, gave an oath of, of allegiance to the Mexican government, and um, he was granted a land grant in the Napa Valley of two leagues, about 18,000 acres. Shortly before granting this, he also married uh, General Vallejo's niece, Maria Ignacia de Soberantes Bale. He got his land grant in 1841, and as soon as he got here, under the terms of the Mexican grants, he had to live on the, on the land and he had to make improvements to it. So his first improvement was to build a sawmill. It was on the Napa River, and it opened and started producing lumber in I think 1842 to 1843. Now the agricultural economy of Mexican California was all based on winter wheat. It was a variety the Spanish brought over. They recognized this area of California as having a very similar climate and it grew very well here. It's the only variety of wheat that will grow here in the Napa Valley. 
So Dr. Bale knew he needed to build a grist mill. He talked to the native peoples that lived there, and they called themselves the Calicomonic, as Miriam had, had told us. Uh, Dr. Bale was going to honor them by naming his rancho Rancho Calicomonic. Um, Yant had named his Rancho Camus. Uh, Gaetano had named his Rancho Tuloque after the native peoples that lived there. He was going to name his Rancho Calicomonic. But evidently that name did not register with whoever was recording these, so he translated it into a similar sounding Spanish phrase, and it became Rancho Carne Humana, the ranch of human flesh. So, in talking to these Indians, they explained to Dr. Bale that you got the best of the property that uh, has been established. The people down the Camus, down on Yonce land, our summers are long and dry, and everything dries up. The, they, uh, those Indians have, in the summertime have to get their water out of stagnant pools in the river bottom. And they explain, we have two creeks on our land that never dry up. And they pointed out Mill Creek, which is the name Dr. Bale gave it, and that creek is still running today. We're in our most severe drought in any, kind of, any history and it's still flowing. There's another that flows down another flank of Spring Mountain called Ritchie Creek, and it's flowing as well, too. So Dr. Bale decided to put his grist mill there on that property. He started building it in 1843 with the lumber that was his sawmill was putting out and opened it in 1846. So what he opened is quite a bit smaller than what you see now. It was 25 feet square and had only a 20 foot water wheel. And no sooner did Dr. Bale open this mill that all hell broke loose here in the Napa Valley. A lot of people came in and became very upset with the Mexican government because they were threatening to take away land of foreign settlers that were coming in and buying property. So in some fine June afternoon, about 15 of them armed themselves and started riding south. Local lore says they even met in Dr. Bale's mill and hatched some of their plans. So they rode south and when they got down to um, where Highway 12 cuts across towards Sonoma. In that part of the area, they met up with the light group from Vacaville. They had a meeting, and on a fine Sunday morning, they marched into Sonoma, pulled down the Mexican flag, put up a flag of their own, declaring this is no longer Mexico, it's the California Republic, and they marched down Spain Street and banged on Vallejo's door until he came out in his uniform and started negotiating with them. And it was the peaceful takeover of what is today the state of California. This started at about the same time the United States went to war with Mexico over Texas. And it was a very short war, but uh, it ended right at the end of 1847 uh, with the signing of the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So that was signed in 1848. And just nine days before that signature, another big event happened here in California, and that was the discovery of gold in um, um, 
Oh, yeah, at the, at the sawmill. Sutter's. On Sutter, exactly, Sutter's Sawmill um, at the South Fork of the American River. So Dr. Bale knew as soon as the government was changing and people were flooding in right after the war and even during the war that he had to expand his mill because more farmers were coming in, more land was going into cultivation, and his mill was not, didn't have the capacity to service the farmers. So in 1846 and 47, he made the acquaintance of another doctor who had a mill, a large mill with two sets of French quartzite millstones. And this doctor also had tuberculosis and living in San Francisco was killing him. So Dr. Bale invited him to come up and spend and live in his adobe where it's warmer and drier and this doctor felt much better after doing that. And Dr. Bale talked him into selling his millstones to Dr. Bale. So he did that in the right at 1847 to 1848. So when that happened, Dr. Bale mortgaged his grist mill, he mortgaged the sawmill, he mortgaged his home to buy, get the money to buy those stones. And he shut down the mill in 1848 so that he could, the engineer that he hired, a man named Leonard Lilly, could begin the reconstruction of his mill based on those two sets of stones. So no sooner than Dr. The Dale shut that mill down was he got word of the gold discovery. So I'm sure he went home and it went something like this. Guess what? We're going to be rich. I'm going to go find some gold. So he packed up and left and was not heard of for almost a year. He returns home sometime in September of 1849. No gold, no money, so sick he could barely stay astride a horse. He takes to his bed, feels better after about a week, summons somebody in and dictates a last will and testament. And then on October 9th of 1849, he dies. So imagine Maria. She's a 30-year-old widow. She's got six kids under the age of 10. She has no source of income and has inherited all of Dr. Bale's debt. She's penniless. So the only way she could figure out how to make some kind of future for her family was to finish the mill. So what you see of that mill, this, this is what Maria Bale opened in 1850. So let's Go back to Maria and so here we have Maria. She is running this mill. It was a custom mill and when we say custom mill it means that the farmers would grow their wheat, they would, they would harvest it and thresh it and they would take it to the mill and the mill would process it into flour for them. Now the, there would be no money changing hands, but the miller would keep about 5% of the grain as payment for the milling services. When Maria opened her mill, it was an automated, what they call an Evans mill, that was built on a patent, a 1790 patent for mill auto automation that conveyed the wheat into processing equipment so you could automatically complete 
the winnowing process, and then you could sift the flour automatically into higher value products. So when Maria opened her mill, she would charge 15% of the wheat as payment. Now there were some people that said that was an outrageous sum to charge. It was three times what everybody else was charging. But farmers were lining up to do it because it saved them so much work. All they had to do was harvest the grain, do a quick threshing, shovel it into a pile and shovel it into sacks and take it to the mill. They didn't have to finish the winnowing process. The mill could do that. And then they could, it would be sifted into a product they called fine white flour. So about 65% of their yield would be fine white flour. The balance would be what they call midlands, which is a coarser texture of flour, and then the bran. Now the beauty of the French quartzite millstones that Dr. Bale bought was when wheat is run through those stones, the bran comes out in nice big flakes so it can be sifted out. So a farmer taking a thousand pounds of wheat into Maria's mill 150 pounds off the top would, would go to the mill as payment, and the balance, 65% would be fine white flour, then some midlands, and then bran, and the farmer would take that back to his farm. He would feed the bran to his animals, he would feed the midlands to his family, and he would sell the fine white flour. So think of the the world in which Maria opened this mill. It was 1850. California had just become the 32nd state in the United States. Congress had rushed California into statehood because of all the gold that was coming out of it. And there was stable civil government here. People were flooding into, there were so many abandoned ships in San Francisco Bay, you could nearly walk from San Francisco to Oakland without getting your feet wet. Ships would come in, they would unload their cargo, and then their crews would disappear because they wanted to go and search for gold. They wanted to get rich. And the first thing they did when they got here was to buy a grub stake. And Maria was selling fine white flour, ton after ton after ton of it. I saw a accounting of the cost of food in the gold fields in California in 1848, or 49 and 50. And they recorded a bag of flour cost $13. So this is what Maria was selling and she was selling tons of it. Every winter from 1840 to 1860, she was farming somewhere between 400 and 1,000 acres of winter wheat. She was a remarkable business person. And around 1860, her oldest daughter, Isadora, she had just married a man named Louis Bruck and they were about to start out on their own. So Maria, who had become quite successful and quite wealthy, by the way, the 1860 census lists Maria <clears throat> as the second largest landowner in the Napa Valley, second only to George Yon, and the third richest person. So the Brucks, Maria gave the mill to the Brucks in 1860 and they took it over and started running it. Shortly later, Carolina Bale, her inheritance was the sawmill on the Napa River. Um, she got married to a Prussian immigrant 
In, the, in about 1850, there was a Hungarian aristocrat that immigrated to California uh, during the gold rush, and he said he's not here for the gold. He thinks that wine is a big future here in California. His name was Agustin Horasti. He bought some land from General Vallejo over in Sonoma and planted the very first commercial vineyard and built the first winery in the state of California. That winery was called Buena Vista, and it's still there. So he hired this Prussian immigrant named Charles Krug, who was the future husband of Carolina Bale, as his uh, apprentice winemaker, and Krug learned the craft under Harassi. After a short while, he became the winemaker for John Patchett, who lived in Napa and who planted the first commercial vineyard and built the first commercial winery in the Napa Valley, and Krug was his winemaker. He had dreams of building his own winery, and when he married Carolina Bale, and she received her inheritance of the sawmill and its 200 acres. They planted a vineyard and built a winery that still stands today on that same property. So all of this is changing in the 1850s and 1860s. And for example, there were other people with other ideas coming in. Uh, there was a German couple in 1853 that moved in and bought some land from Maria Bale, just a little north of here. His name was Jacob Schramm. Um, he planted a vineyard and built a winery. It's called Schramsburg, and it's still there, and it produces very fine, sparkling wines. And then, in around sometime in the early 1860s, a severe drought hit the area that killed the annual crops, like the, the winter wheat and the maize that would be grown here. And everybody noticed that those farmers that farm perennial crops, like grapes or olives or walnuts or apricots or prunes, were fine. Those have roots that go down deep to find whatever they need. So, the farmers that were growing these found that they could dry their fruits and their walnuts, they could process their grapes into wine and their olives into oil, and go to San Francisco and sell them for far more than they ever could selling fine white flour. So the mill became a derelict. So after the Brucks decided, realized there was really no future in the mill because there, were, there was hardly any wheat being grown in the Napa Valley, they sold the mill to another uh, company who held it for about three or four years. And then Reverend Lyman, who lived on the other side of the creek, bought the mill to secure his water rights to Mill Creek. And Reverend Lyman said it also gave his son something to do. So it was the Lyman family that were really the keepers of the mill. And the second generation of the Lyman family that gave, after Reverend Lyman's death, the mill to the native sons of the Golden West, who preserved it for a time and then gave it to the state of California, which arrested its decay. Here we see a photograph of the west side of the mill, taken around between 1890 to 1910. You can tell by the dress. This is the west-facing part of the mill, and this is a structure that's no longer there. That housed a steam engine that was used to turn the wheel during those drought years, when the, the creek still flowed, but the level was not enough to turn the wheel. So um, during 
the Great War. We don't know exactly when it was. It was either in 1918 or 1919. The Army Corps of Engineers came through here and tore out the steam engine and just about all of the metal that was in the mill. The only thing that was left, you can see a section of the water wheel here. The hub of the water wheel is original to the 1846 mill. And the next slide. This is a look inside the mill with the mill being open. These parts, the millstone assembly, that's original to the 1840, it's actually 1840, because these stones originally went into that San Francisco mill in 1840. So we know that they are about 200 years old because these stones are the French quartzite that were quarried in the Marne Valley in France. So this was quarried built into stones and shipped to San Francisco. The second mill is, you can see the cover of that mill, but this is a rare site. Um, in, in early human history, people first started um, grinding grain by rubbing two rocks together, which was laborious but effective. But people quickly learned that by doing that, and after about 20 or 30 years of eating your porridge with stone dust in it, your teeth get worn away. So about 2,000 years ago, the Romans figured out how to use heavy stones to mill grain without the stones touching. And that's the way we do it at the mill today. What you see here, this mill is completely empty. It has to be opened up and cleaned because the way these stones form, there are a lot of voids in them and we have to dig the flour out because it will go rancid and contaminate new things coming through. The thing that we have to guard against is when we put the mill back together, next slide, there always has to be grain between the stones. So when we get ready to close the mill back up, we have to take a big bucket of grain and completely cover the bedstone. And then we can put the runner stone on top and lower it down so it's resting on the grain. And then we know we can safely start up the mill so that they're separated and there's a cushion of grain between the stones. So I think this is the end of the slides. So that's our story and uh, if there's any questions, thank you. Thank you so much Dave and Miriam uh, for that fascinating uh, presentation on, on the settling, settling of our valley. Um, just in, in case you, your interest has been piqued about Bale Mill, uh, the mill is open every weekend, Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 4. And uh, Dave will be there and there's other millers there also. So we hope you'll come and visit the mill. It's really an extraordinary uh, place to visit and um, I don't think many of us really understand how really uh, wonderful it is to have such a facility in in our county. It's, it's quite a remarkable building. So we are, um, this was our second in our presentations uh, regarding the history of Napa. Our next one is coming up. It will be the Chinese immigrants in Napa Valley, and that will be on September 22nd. 
We hope you all enjoyed this and will come back and uh, enjoy our next topics. We'll be sending out uh, emails and flyers to let you know exactly dates and times. So thank you very much.